A Christian is a person who should be in a constant state of motion. On one hand, we're to put off our old way of life, and on the other hand, we're to be pursuing a life of godliness by faith. At the end of Paul's first epistle to Timothy, after warning him about false teachers and their false teaching, Paul now provides instructions to Timothy on what a Christian should be pursuing while living in this world. Today's message is delivered by Elder Mark Ruggles from 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 11-16, through 16, and is entitled, Keep the Faith. Good morning. There it is. Good morning. Whew, man. I almost blew out my voice singing over there a second ago. You can't be singing like large anthems like that and then expect me to come up here and preach. Uh, we are in the book of First Timothy. We're actually coming down to, to the wire here. We're coming to the close of it. So uh, in the next couple of weeks, we will finish this book, Lord willing. And then we're going to go right into Second Timothy after we finish with First Timothy. So uh, this week, today, we are going to look at First Timothy chapter 6 verses 11 through 16. So if you have your Bible, please uh, turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 6, starting in verse 11. So verse 11 begins this way. But flee from these things, you man of God, and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called, and you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things, and, to, and of Christ Jesus, who testified the good confession before Pontius Pilate, that you keep the commandment without stain or reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will bring about at the proper time. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone possesses immortality and dwells in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see. To him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we do come, Lord, even now, God, by faith in Christ. Father, we ask for the aid of your Spirit to help us to listen. God, there is um, so much here. Lord, we ask that you would, God, give us uh, ears to hear. Lord, more importantly, God, give us uh, hearts, God, that are eager, Lord, to obey. Father, for we know that your word tells us, Lord, that, that if we um, are willing, God, to do your will, we will know of the teaching. And so, Father, we um, determine even now, God, that we will do, Lord, whatever you show us. And, God, we determine these things, Lord, for Christ's sake, God, that he might be seen in us. We ask, God, that you would glorify him in us, we pray, God. In his name we do pray. Amen. So Thomas Aquinas once said this quote, <clears throat> to one who has faith, no explanation is necessary. To the one without faith, no explanation is possible. And it's a thought-provoking quote. It describes the difference between two groups of people. 
and it assumes that some event has happened uh, to each that, uh, for which a, an explanation is necessary. The main difference between these two groups is the possession of a commodity called faith. For those who have it, the implication is that they are better off than those who don't. In today's passage, Paul affirms that Timothy had this precious commodity and that he should fight for it, that he should strive for it, and that he should keep it. However, what is faith? Where do I get it? How much will it cost me to get some? Is this faith simply a belief in self? Is it a belief that better times are just around the corner? Is it a belief that you can achieve anything you want in life if you just believe enough? No, these are all worldly notions about faith. These are things uh, that today's movements often call faith in faith. Um, these are all worldly notions. However, we see in Paul's instruction to Timothy, keeping the faith involves some very intentional activities on our part. It involves a confession and it is deeply rooted in proper theology. Certainly there are many false concepts regarding faith. So let's read this passage for ourselves and let it correct our own thinking about faith. And let's hear Paul speaking directly to us about how to keep the faith. So just like we uh, always do, we want to look at the verses that we're looking at here in their context. And so 1 Timothy, the context of these words are uh, the first letter of Paul to Timothy, his young protege. And it's a first and a final series of letters. Uh, along with 2 Timothy and Titus, they're all called the pastoral epistles. 1 Timothy offers practical and pastoral advice from the aging apostle Paul to a young pastor named Timothy who was working in the church at Ephesus. This epistle presents the most explicit and complete instructions for church leadership and organization in the entire Bible. It's really how we are to uh, administer and do things in the church of Christ. It includes sections on appropriate conduct in worship gatherings, the qualifications of elders and deacons, and the proper order of church discipline. Paul advised Timothy on these practical matters in a way that we should, that would have helped the young pastor to emphasize the purity that should characterize Christian leaders and the gatherings they oversee. Now, in the immediate context, Paul is instructing Timothy regarding false teachers, and this is something that Pastor Knight talk, uh, taught about last week. Um, he's instructing him to avoid false teachers and false teaching and how to find true contentment. And unlike these men, Paul warns Timothy about who, uh, about who only have morbid interest in controversial questions and disputes about words, and who suppose godliness is a means of gain. Uh, Timothy was to mix godliness with contentment and avoid the worldly character of such men. At their core, these false teachers were greedy and longing for financial gain. That's the kind of gain that they thought godliness would bring them. However, Paul says that such ambitions only need, lead to foolishness and harmful desires, and they plunge men into ruin and destruction. Also contrasted against his instructions to Timothy to keep the faith is the love of money, which leads those who long for it away from the faith. So instead of keeping the faith, if you chase after money, you're going to be led away from the faith. And these false teachers show their true colors by walking away from the faith when they perceive there's no more money in it. Therefore, therefore, Paul gives Timothy some practical parting instructions on how to fight the good fight of faith. And so as we begin in verses 11 and 12, the first point that I have for you is Paul's practical instructions. Paul's practical instructions. So, he begins by giving Timothy some practical instructions and us also about keeping the faith. And the first thing that we are to do is to flee something. And Pastor Knight kind of went over uh, what we are to flee kind of in more detail last week. 
And Paul says, but flee from these things, you man of God. These things that Paul refers to here are those things that he's just been talking about, about false doctrine, about controversial questions, disputes about words and envy, strife, abusive language, evil suspicions, and constant friction, the constant friction that they produce. And of course, the love of money. And if you follow all of these things, then you will fall away from the faith. So Paul instructs us to flee from these things. And as you probably expected, the command is in the present tense, which means that we are to flee and keep on fleeing. We're to keep running from these things. We are not to run about 50 yards away and then stop. We are to keep running. You know how that is, right? Whenever you're tempted by some sin, you, you think in your mind, I shouldn't do this. This is wrong. And you flee a little bit away and that temptation keeps coming after you and you stop and then you begin to reason with it. Well, okay, maybe. And then you fall because you didn't keep fleeing. You didn't keep running. The idea is to flee and keep fleeing. The Greek word uh, for flee is fugo, uh, and it's the root word of our English word fugitive. And, as, and, and last week, Pastor Knight actually touched on uh, my illustration, so I think he was looking at my notes, um, about the movie The Fugitive. Uh, and in that movie, uh, Dr. Richard Kemble is, as he said last week, was uh, wrongfully accused of killing his wife. And so we see him in the movie, uh, to summarize the entire movie, really, is you see uh, the, the character of Harrison Ford, Richard Kimball, fleeing from Tommy Lee Jones, uh, whose character is a U.S. Marshal. He flees throughout the entire movie. He runs from him everywhere he goes. And Tommy Lee Jones chases after him everywhere he goes. But he flees as if his life depended on it, because it did. He was sentenced to death. They were going to give him the death sentence. So if he was caught, he was going to be killed. And so he fleed as if his life depended on it. And that's exactly the picture that Paul paints for us here. We are to flee these things, these things that he's just been talking about, because our spiritual life depends on it. And this is not the only time that Paul uses this verb to flee. We can see it also in his other letters. Here's some other practical ways that we, uh, that we need to flee. These are other things that we are supposed to flee. So in 1 Corinthians 6, 18, he says, flee immorality. Every other sin that a man commits is outside the body. But the immoral man sins against his own body. So we are to flee immorality. Immorality is a, um, uh, all sin is sin, but immorality holds a special, uh, it's a special kind of sin because, as the verse says, you sin against your own body. It's a sin that sticks with you. It's a sin that stays with you even many, many years after uh, you may have repented and walked away from it. And so we are to flee immorality. 1 Corinthians 10, 14 says, therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. Flee from idolatry. So anything that would take the place of God, being God in your heart, you are to flee from that. And you can put whatever you want in that category, family, money, immorality, anything else that takes the place of God, the worship of God, is idolatry. So we are to flee from idolatry. 2 Timothy 2.22 says, now flee from youthful lusts and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Almost an echo of what we're reading here in this passage today. We are to flee from youthful lusts. Those are the, the lusts that are specifically, that characterize youth. And those things are like levity, things that wanting to always have fun and being entertained all the time. Um, Life is not all about entertainment, uh, young people. Um, my kids are, are notorious for wanting to fill every moment of the day with some kind of entertainment. Um, that is a youthful lust. It's a youthful lust. And we are to flee that. 
We are to flee those things that are particular to being young. However, that's not the only, that's only one side of the coin. We're to flee something, but the, the verses here also tell us that we are to pursue something else. And that's really where we're going to spend the bulk of our time today. Uh, Pastor and I, again, talked a lot about uh, fleeing last week. Today, we're going to talk about what we are to pursue. At the end of the verse, Paul says, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. Again, like the command to flee, as you might expect, this command is also in the present tense, which means that we are to pursue these virtues and keep pursuing them. You can picture it this way. We should always constantly be in second place in the Christian race. Second place. Worldliness and greed behind us, nipping at our heels, while we are constantly pursuing godliness in front of us, Christ's likeness ahead of us. And so we're always in this constant state of tension where there's worldliness and greed behind us trying to catch us and we're fleeing from that, but we're also reaching out trying to get godliness, trying to overtake godliness. So we should strive to overtake these virtues that are ahead of us and at the same time not be overtaken by worldliness and greed. So what are these virtues? Well, first we should note that they are directly contrasted with the evils of worldliness listed in verses 4 and 5. In verses 4 and 5, it talks about, well, I'll start at verse 3. If anyone advocates a different doctrine and does not agree with sound words, those of our Lord Jesus Christ, and with the doctrine conforming to godliness, he is conceited and understands nothing but has a morbid interest in controversial questions and disputes about words, out of which arise envy, strife, abusive language, evil suspicions, and constant friction between men of depraved mind and deprived of the truth, who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. Uh, these should sound very familiar. The passage that Andy read about the uh, fruit of the flesh, the, the, uh, those evidences of the flesh. And verses 4 and 5 are directly contrasted with what we see here in our text. Secondly, we should quickly recognize these virtues as they are a simple restatement of the fruit of the Spirit that Andy read in Galatians chapter 5 earlier. In other words, we can pursue these things, these virtues, through the aid. We can't pursue them without the aid of the Spirit. And finally, we should also note that worldliness stems from not agreeing with the doctrine that conforms to godliness. In verse 3, we just read that. So in other words, if we're going to pursue godliness, doctrine will be involved. We will, we will not be conformed to the image of his son without the word of God. So the word of God, the Bible, is instrumental to pursuing these virtues. So here are the virtues uh, in a bulleted list, and we're going to go through these, but we're also going to look at some verses that talk about practical ways to pursue these things. So righteousness, the word there is dikaiosune. In, in simple terms, it refers to the quality of being upright. It's speaking of personal, practical holiness. In a word, it's speaking about sanctification. So how do we pursue righteousness? How do we pursue sanctification? Philippians 4.8 says this, Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. And so we are to dwell, have our mind dwelling on things that are excellent. Uh, these are things that are found in the Word of God. And so uh, the first way that we can follow after, pursue righteousness, is to dwell on heavenly things. Set our mind in the heavenly places. That's one way to pursue righteousness. 1 Thessalonians 5, 21 and 22 says... But examine everything carefully. 
Hold fast to that which is good. Abstain from every form of evil. And so we are to examine everything carefully. So everything that you do, you should examine it carefully to see whether it is good or evil. We need to be discerning. This is talking about discernment. So if we are going to pursue righteousness, we need to have some discernment. And practically speaking, these will be things like maybe the kind of movies you watch, maybe the kind of TV shows you watch, maybe the kind of books that you read. We have to have discernment about whether or not these things are somehow slowly feeding you error or if they're building up the truth. And so we need to be discerning. One more verse about pursuing righteousness. Romans 12, 1 and 2. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. We are to present our bodies as a living sacrifice. So you are to give your very body to God. You are to use your body, your physical body, to serve the Lord. That's one way that we can pursue righteousness. And we are to not be, trans, not to be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You are to take your mind to the Word and let the water of the Word wash your mind. That's how we pursue righteousness. You won't be upright unless you fill your mind with Scripture. You have to have the Word constantly bathing and washing your mind so that you begin to think right. If you think right, then you will act right. And so that's how we pursue. Those are practical ways to pursue righteousness. So the next virtue that we see in verse 11 is godliness, godliness. The word is eusubia, and it refers to sacred awe or reverence exhibited, especially in actions, and most literally, the word means well worship. That's what it literally means. It is characterized by a Godward attitude, which is displayed in a Godward life, meaning Godward meaning that you're pointed towards God right? You're, you're, you're the whole of your life is focused and pointed towards obeying and worshiping God. First Timothy 4, 7, and 8. It says, but have nothing to do with worldly fables fit only for old women. On the other hand, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. For bodily discipline is only of little profit, but godliness is profitable for all things since it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. So godliness is a means of great gain when accompanied with contentment because we, both, we, we benefit from it here in this life and also in the life to come. And we spoke a little bit yesterday, even in the Man Up group, about discipline. We want to discipline ourselves for the purpose of godliness. We need to remember that our, our goal is godliness. And so when we want to, uh, when we discipline ourselves to achieve godliness, um, it won't become drudgery. We have to remember the goal of what we're trying to do. We want to be godly people. If we are believers in Jesus Christ, we want to be like Christ. We want to be holy people. And so uh, we need to have that goal in mind. 1 Timothy 6.3, again, another way uh, of pursuing godliness. It says, if anyone advocates a different doctrine and does not agree with sound words, we just read this a moment ago, those of our Lord Jesus Christ and with the doctrine conforming to godliness. You won't have godliness without doctrine. You won't have godliness without the truth of the gospel. 2 Peter 1, 2 and 3 Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. And so God has granted everything to us pertaining to life and godliness. He's already given you all the tools that you need. You have to now pursue it. 
You have to strive for it. The next word that we see, the next virtue that we are to pursue is faith. Faith. And this describes a firm persuasion, conviction, or belief in the truth. The veracity or reality or faithfulness, that's what, that's what this word means. Faith is not just mental assent, but it's a firm conviction, a surrender to that truth and a conduct in accord with one's own surrender, meaning that faith shows itself by a changed life. If you believe in something, then it should show in your life, right? If I, if I believe that there is a snake under this log, a poisonous snake under this log. That belief will lead me not to lift up the log, right? Um, that belief will come out in my life and in my actions, right? Kind of a weird illustration. I just brought that up out of my mind. But um, your belief will lead your actions, right? And so if we have faith, then it should show in what we do. And our faith, of course, is in a person, in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that faith will lead us to act in certain ways in accord with the gospel. And so Romans 10, 17 says, So faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. So if we are going to pursue faith, then guess what? We have to be under the preaching of the word. That's how, you, that's how faith is built. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ. We are built up in our faith when we sit under the word of God. And so that's how we pursue faith. 1 Thessalonians 2.13, For this reason, we also constantly thank God that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but for what it really is, the word of God, which also performs its work in you who believe, who believe. So when we hear the word of God, when we hear preaching, when you hear me talking to you right now, reading from the word of God, this isn't things that I came up with. I'm reading from you the Bible. These are the words of God. And so we believe them to be the word of God. That's faith. Faith is believing that this is God's word, that it is inerrant and infallible, that it is his very word, his very breath, and that we should follow every word of it because not one jot or tittle will pass away is what Jesus said. Colossians 2, 6, and 7, Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, having been firmly rooted and now being built up in him and established in your faith, just as you were instructed and overflowing with gratitude. So there is a, uh, an establishment of our faith. Just as we receive the Lord, so we are to walk in him. And you just talked about this in Bible study. We are to repent and believe. This is how we received Christ. If you're born again, if you're a believer, you received Christ by repentance and faith. And that's how you walk throughout the rest of your Christian days. You walk by repentance and faith. You fall down, you get up, you put your faith in Christ. You fall down, you get up, you put your faith in Christ. That's the Christian walk. Repentance, faith. That's how you pursue faith. The moment that you fall down and you don't get back up and don't put your faith in Christ, then guess what? You've stopped pursuing faith. The last one on faith, Jude 1, 20 and 21. But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. So we are to build ourselves up on our most holy faith. This faith is, it's holy It's a faith given to us by God as a gift. And it is, it's holy. It is, it's, it has the same character as God does. It is holy. It is sanctified. It is set apart. And this faith, we are to be, we are to build ourselves up on it, praying in the Holy Spirit. So there is prayer involved in faith, pursuing faith. And 
as a transition into the next virtue, we are to keep ourselves in the love of God, in the agape of God. We are to remind ourselves that God loves us. We are to remind ourselves of all that God did for us to save us and bring, him, bring us to himself. You know that little children's song that we sing sometimes in Bible study? Jesus loves me, this I know. How do we know it? Because the Bible tells me so. We need to sing that little song to ourselves all the time and remind ourselves about the love of God. We are to keep ourselves in the love of God. So the next virtue is agape, and it describes the unconditional sacrificial love that biblically refers to a love that God is, that God shows, and that God enables in his children. It is not based on emotions or feelings, but it's an act of self-sacrifice to serve the recipient. 1 Timothy 1.5 says, But the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. So our goal, the goal of the instruction, the goal of doctrine is love from a pure heart. So Doctrine should result in love. It should result in this agape love that's self-sacrificial love that seeks to meet the needs of others. Colossians 3.14, beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. We have to put it on like a garment, which which really speaks about intentionality. You're not just going to love somebody unconditionally with agape love just by doing it, right? You're going, to have to do, you're going to have to think about it. You're going to have to think, I need to get in that person's life and I need to see what their needs are and then I need to try to meet those needs. That's agape love. And so we need to have some intention about agape love. 1 Peter 4, 8 says, Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another because love covers a multitude of sins. So we are to keep fervent in this love. We are to heat it up We are to stoke it like a fire. So if you don't, then we all know that love cools off, right? And so we need to keep stoking that fire of love, keep stoking it for one another. That's how we pursue agape love. The next virtue that we see is perseverance, hupomone, it's, uh, it refers to steadfastness in the face of difficult circumstances or afflictions. It literally, it literally means abiding under. It's the, uh, the root idea is uh, to remain under some discipline, uh, being subjected to something that demands the submission of one's will to something against he would naturally rebel. It's really being subjected to some trial and you remain under that trial. It portrays a picture of bearing up under a heavy load. And so if hope focuses on the future, hope is a future thing, the steadfastness of hope is its expression in the present time of affliction. That's perseverance. That's what perseverance is. You have hope for something in the future, but perseverance is working out that hope now. So you're under some trial and you're hoping for something in the future, and you're bearing up under a heavy load now, waiting for that future event, waiting for that future hope. That's what perseverance is. And Romans 5, 3, 5 says, and not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance, and perseverance, proven character, and proven character, hope, And hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. And so the way that we we pursue perseverance is that in this verse, we have to know something. We have to know that tribulation, these trials that we are under, they bring about perseverance. They bring about that perseverance. And so we have to know that. We have to have that in our mind that I'm not going through this for no reason. God is working in me to try to bring about perseverance, proven character, hope, and that hope does not disappoint, right? And so we have to know those things. The next virtue that we see 
The last virtue in verse 11 is gentleness. And it describes, it describes composure or a calm dis, uh, disposition, a mildness of dis, disposition, gentleness of spirit or meekness. It is uh, the, a power or strength under control. You can kind of think of it as like a, a, a strong horse that you can bridle in, right? It's that strength under control. And so how do we pursue gentleness? How do we pursue gentleness? Well, the best place to go is to the Lord Jesus Christ, right? And he says in Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30, he says, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. If you want to find gentleness, you've got to go to the source of gentleness. Christ said right here that he is gentle and humble in heart. He is the humblest of all men. And so if you want to find out what it means to be gentle and lowly, you've got to come to Christ. You've got to come to Christ by faith. So in verse 12, Paul switches from running to a fighting metaphor to... Uh, He switches from running to a fighting metaphor to help further describe the same idea begun in the previous verse. In other words, to fight the good fight of faith, you need to pursue all the virtues that he just talked about. Pursuing these virtues are part of fighting the good fight of faith. J.C. Ryle says this on uh, fighting the flesh. He said, let us dismiss from our minds the crude modern idea that a believer has only got to sit still and yield himself to God. This is the let go and let God type of mentality. And guess what? He died in 1900. So this is not a modern idea, this let go and let God. This was something that he was talking about in in the early 1800s, late 1800s. He says, let us rather maintain the language of Scripture and strive to mortify the deeds of our body, to crucify our flesh, to cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of flesh and spirit, to wrestle to fight, and to live the soldier's life. One might think that the account of the armor of God in the epistle to the Ephesians ought to settle the question of our duty. But the plain truth is, men will persist in confounding two things that differ. That is, justification and sanctification. In justification, the word to be addressed to a man is believe, only believe. In sanctification... The word must be watch, pray, and fight. What God has divided, let us not mingle and confuse. End quote. And another quote from an unknown author really kind of summarizes Ryle's point well. It says, conversion is the miracle of a moment. Becoming like Christ is the work of a lifetime. Fighting the good fight of faith speaks of our sanctification, and we are to agonize in it. That's what the word for, the Greek word for fight is. It's agonisma, agonismi. It means to strive and to labor in and uh, to continually fight for the faith. And again, it's in the present tense. So you're supposed to continually do it, continually keep fighting and pursuing and fighting with this good fight of faith. So it's a pursuit It's a good fight, and it's a prize to lay hold of. And just like those Greek athletes who competed in the games in Paul's day, they sought to win a prize of a perishable wreath, meaning that they wanted to grasp it and capture it for themselves. We are to grasp the eternal life to which we were called. Paul is not saying that you're to lay hold of something that you don't already have. He's calling Timothy and us to experience more of the eternal life that we've already been given in our daily walk. We are to lay hold of it. We're to grasp it. Or or another word you can think of here is that we are to understand it better. We're We're to understand what it means to have this hope of eternal life in our own daily walk. And it was this hope, this hope of eternal life that caused Timothy to make the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Timothy willingly testified 
about the hope that was in him. And he did so before many witnesses. Now, we don't know when he did that, but uh, the idea was that he maybe stood up in church or something, stood up in a gathering, and he talked about the hope that was in him. So Paul says, starting in verse 13, Timothy, it's great that you made that profession before many witnesses, but I'm going to call two more witnesses, and they're even more important. Paul gives Timothy a charge in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus to do something important. He's ordering Timothy to do something and to make sure Timothy understands the importance of, of the command. Paul calls in the witnesses of the Father and the Son. Paul says, I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things. He says, I'm ordering you, Timothy, in the presence of the creator and sustainer of all things. I am passing my orders on to you from God himself who keeps your very life in his hands. This charge I am making to you comes from the top. So listen up. And not only does he charge him in the presence of God, but the Son too. Paul continues, and of Christ Jesus, who testified the good confession before Pontius Pilate. Like Timothy, Jesus had his own good confession. However, what was that confession that he made? Adam Clark states, the confession made by Christ before Pontius Pilate is that he was Messiah, the king, but that his kingdom was not of this world and that hereafter he should be seen coming in the clouds of heaven to judge the quick and the dead. Robert F. Horton said this about Jesus' confession. His confession before Pontius uh, Pontius Pilate became the model, the motive, and the power of all the confessions which his followers make for him. So certainly Paul is seeking to encourage Timothy and us to take this charge to heart. We are to remember that we live every moment in God's presence. He is here right now. He is everywhere at all times. He is omnipresent. We can't see him, but he is here. We are living in his presence this very moment. As the late R.C. Sproul often said, we live quorum Deo, which is a Latin expression that means before the face of God. We are living before God's very eyes every moment of our lives. We always live under his watchful gaze. We live in the presence of the very sustainer of our lives. The Bible tells us that in him we live and move and exist. It's in the sphere of God that we exist. And we are to remember the son's confession which led to his very death on our behalf. We are to remember that we will be joint heirs with him in his kingdom when he comes again. These factors are meant to motivate us toward what Paul mentions next. We are motivated to keep the commandment without stain or reproach. In the context, we are to keep the commands that Paul just issued, namely fleeing worldliness and greed, pursuing righteousness and Christ-likeness, fighting the good fight of faith, and laying hold of the eternal life to which we were called. However, more broadly, it could mean that we are to keep the whole of Christian doctrine, and that without stain or reproach. There should be no blot on our account. There should be no smudge next to your name in the records in heaven. And there should be no occasion for blame. We should be blameless when it comes to sin. So does that mean that you're supposed to be perfect? No. It doesn't mean you're supposed to be perfect. What it does mean is that you're supposed to keep short accounts with sin. When you fall down, you get up and you get it right. 
We are to repent and seek God's forgiveness when we sin, and we are to seek others' forgiveness when we've wronged anyone else. Two verses come to mind regarding our Godward and our manward need for forgiveness. 1 John 1.9 says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just, faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So when we confess our sins, somebody said it earlier in Bible study, when we agree with God, when we say the same as God, that's what it means to confess. Homo legeo, you say that it is sin. You agree with God about sin and you turn from it and repent. Think again, change your mind and pursue righteousness. Place your faith in Christ. Romans 12, 18, the manward direction of forgiveness. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. You can't control what other people are going to do. If I have wronged you and I come to you and ask you for forgiveness, then you may say, hey man, get lost. I can't do anything about what you're going to do, how you're going to react, but I've done my part. I've come to you in sincerity of heart and ask for your forgiveness. The charge is not that we live perfect lives, but that we live blameless lives. There should be no charges that anyone can bring against us that would stick. When we have wronged anyone, we must seek their forgiveness, thus removing any occasion for blame. We are to live upright lives, which includes humbling ourselves and getting things right when necessary. Even though you have wronged others, it should be their testimony that you came to them to get things right. So is there anyone today that could lay a charge against your account? Is there anyone that you have wronged that you have not gotten it right with? You know who those people are. You know who you, you have wronged. If you have not gotten it right, then I charge you, as Paul does, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, that before this day is over, get it right. Get it right. And how long are we to seek to live these blameless lives through the power of the Spirit? Paul says we are to do this until a certain future event occurs. Of course, the word until speaks about a duration of time. We are to keep pursuing this life of godliness over the long haul. It is a lifelong pursuit, which is either until we go to glory or until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. So this is not just about a duration of time, but it's also in, it involves our blessed hope, the, coming, the second coming of Christ. And why does Paul mention the second coming in this context? Well, think about what he's just commanded us to do. We are to keep the commandment without stain, or reproach. So what could motivate us more toward holy living than the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ? Think about it. If you knew that Jesus was coming back tomorrow, if you knew that he was coming back tomorrow, you'd be getting some stuff right in your life today, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you? Right? And why do we do that? It's, it's kind of like this illustration that I thought of. When you're driving and you suddenly see a police officer behind you, what do you do? You suddenly became, you become the model driver, right? You're like suddenly slowing down. You're right at the speed limit. You're signaling for every lane change. You make sure you've got like enough distance between you and the car in front of you. You know, you become the model driver. You're, you're driving like you're trying to pass the driver's license test all of a sudden, Right? And why do you do that? Because you fear the authority of the officer behind you. You fear that authority. How much more? How much more should we, should we fear the authority of Christ? He is the one who is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. He is the one who kills and makes alive. He brings down to Sheol and raises up. He is the one who possesses the keys of death and Hades. He is the one described as a consuming fire 
who punishes with thunder, earthquake, loud noise, and with whirlwind and tempest, whose voice sounds like a loud trumpet, like the sound of many waters, and like the sound of loud thunder, and who speaks from the whirlwind. It is he who laid the foundation of the earth and laid its cornerstone. He enclosed the sea with doors and told the proud waves where to stop. The reason the ocean doesn't just overrun all the cities on the coast is because God told the waters where to stop. He caused the sun and the moon to stand still for about a whole day. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He's the beginning and the end, the one who is to come. He is the Almighty, all-powerful God. And as Christ said, yes, I tell you, fear him, fear him. But not only are we to fear him, we are to put our hope in him and his blessed return. When he returns, the dead in Christ will rise first, first. When he returns, he will take us to himself that where he is, we may be also. When he returns, he is coming to recompense everyone for what they have done. When he returns, all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. When he returns, the Lord will slay the man of lawlessness with the breath of his mouth and bring an end to him by his appearing. He will speak a word and he will be done. When he appears... Praise God. We will be like him because we will see him just as he is. And everyone who has this hope fixed on him does something. They purify themselves just as he is pure. This is the hope of his coming for us again. It's the fuel of our purification. It is the catalyst for our sanctification. His appearing is synonymous with our glorification. Amen? And so we agree with John the Revelator. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. And Paul ends with a doxology in verses 15 and 16. He says, however, even though we are eager for his appearance, Paul breaks out in praise regarding God's sovereignty and the timing of the second coming of Christ. He says that he will bring it about at the proper time. It is a fixed day of which no one knows but the Father alone. It is his divine prerogative to keep the exact day hidden, and so we are warned repeatedly to be on the alert, for we do not know the day or the hour of his appearance. For the divine wisdom of his plan, Paul rejoices and proclaims that God is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. So we shouldn't be worried. We shouldn't fret about those who are in power right now. You might not agree with the policies uh, and decision of our national leaders. You may be bewildered by the fact that terrorists have taken over uh, in uh, some allied countries. You may fear that evil men are in power around the world. Do not fear. Do not fear. God is on the throne. He is king over all kings. He is Lord over all lords. It is he who changes the times and the epics. He removes kings and establishes kings, according to Daniel 2.21. He alone is the blessed and only sovereign. There is no higher potentate. There is no earthly king whose kingdom is everlasting. There is no worldly sovereign that can outlast death. There is no monarch under the sun who can claim that he owns all things. Only God possesses infinite riches, and only he will reign forever. Amen? And Paul says that he alone possesses immortality, meaning that he will never die. And to those whom he wills to bestow that gift, meaning eternal life, they will never die either. With him is the fountain of life. He is the fountain of living waters. 
who offers all who are thirsty to come and take the water of life without cost. In him is life. John Gill states, angels are immortal and so are the souls of men and so will be the bodies of men after the resurrection. But then neither of these have immortality of themselves. They have it from God who only has it of himself originally, essentially, and inderivatively. So God is the only one who has immortality in himself. <clears throat> and while those who believe will receive immortality from God, Spurgeon makes this interesting point. He says, the immortal one, in a sense, surrendered his immortality. Over him, death had no power at all. It is of him that Paul wrote, who only hath immortality. Who could without his consent have laid a hand upon the prince of life, the son of God, and said to him, you shall die. No one could have done that. It was purely voluntary, a purely voluntary act for Christ to die at all, not merely to die on the cross. Consequently, this is a telling proof of his love. And finally, the commentator Vine amplifies this point by saying, to God alone belongs immortality, essentially, underivatively. He is neither liable to nor capable of death. The Son of God could become capable of death only through incarnation. Christ, who was eternally one with the Father in Godhood, became man in order to die. So he tasted death for everyone in order to bring many sons to glory. Part of that glory is to bring us to God, who Paul says dwells in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see. The glory that we will experience is that as sinners we will be glorified, finally saved, and completely washed, free of sin, so that we can stand in God's sight. The great promise of glorification is that the one whom no man has seen or can see will be seen by us. What Moses longed for and was denied as he was placed in the cleft of a rock has been promised to us because of Christ. We will see him and live. Revelation 22, 3 and 5 says, There will no longer be any curse, and the throne of God and the Lamb of God and the Lamb will be in it, and his bondservants will see him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and there will no longer be any night, and they will not have any need of light of a lamp nor the light of the sun, because the Lord God will illumine them, and they will reign forever and ever. And after having reflected on the sovereignty and power of God and the call to which he's called us to, Paul ends where we should all end in doxology. He closes this section by ascribing honor and eternal dominion to God. We are to praise God and give him the honor due his name for the wonderful works he has done and for his unmatched person. And as the scripture says, who else is like our God? Amen? Amen. So the application is pretty clear, just like the Bible study was pretty clear. We are to repent and believe is what Andy said earlier. These applications are pretty clear as well. We are to flee false doctrine and worldliness. Flee, run, and keep on running. We are to pursue godliness and Christ's likeness, and keep on pursuing it. We are to keep these commandments in all holiness without blame until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And above all, we are to worship God. We are to worship God. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we, we thank you, Lord God, for your word. We thank you, God, that you have given us very practical, clear instructions on what we are to do. God, we are to flee. Uh, 
worldliness, and greed. God, we are to pursue the virtues of Christ-likeness, Lord. God, we are to pursue, God, in all holiness. We ask, God, that you would help us, Lord, by your spirit. We know, Father, that um, these things are not possible in our own power. And so, Father, we ask, Lord, for the aid of your indwelling spirit. God, that Christ might be seen in us in this day and time and help us, Lord, to persevere in these things, God, until his coming when he will be seen, God, by every eye, when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We ask it, Lord, in Christ's name, amen.